What is up, everybody? Mr. Rapertus here. Welcome to 7.2. Um, this is the second to last unit. This is the second of four videos in this unit. We're getting close, everybody. Um, just a reminder in terms of what this unit's about. It's about decolonization. To decolonize is to end colonization. In this case, we are ending imperialism. We talked about India in the last video. In this video, we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa, which is basically um, everything south of Africa, um, sub meaning below. So let's rock and roll here. Let's get into this. So just as I mentioned in the last one, in terms of we're going to keep going over this historical circumstance, historical circumstance for the millionth time means the background, what came before the event, what led up to something. And in this case, the historical circumstance in Africa that leads to decolonization is colonization, is imperialism. And if you remember or recall, or if you don't, that's okay. That's what I'm here for, for a little review. Europeans in the 1800s are going to split up Africa. It is called the scramble for Africa. And in the late 1800s, if you remember, um, this area of called the Congo was conquered by a country called Belgium, which is in Europe. And they conquer this area and it leads to all the other Europeans trying to go in and conquer Africa. And they were able to do it because they had superior weaponry um, and superior technology. But as a result of this, the people who live in these areas, the people who are um, subjugated, oh, good word, subjugate, um, kept down, uh, are treated horribly by the Europeans. It's absolutely awful. Um, they are, we mentioned the human zoos. Um, people are just going to be treated as second or third or fourth class citizens, even though it is their homeland. Um, some of these areas here that are conquered by the Europeans are called settler colonies, meaning Europeans sent a lot of people there. Like Australia is an example of a settler colony. South Africa down here is a settler colony. Some areas are not. You have a very few group of uh, Europeans who hire local people to help them run the government. So these, I do want to point out this, and we mentioned this, these borders here are created by the Europeans. When they create them, they don't care who lives in them. They don't care. Um, they're not creating borders based on ethnic groups. Like we talked about India, trying to split it between where the Muslims are and the Hindus. That's conscious effort to try and um, create these two countries based on a population, so their majority. In this case, when they created these borders during imperialism, they split up different ethnic groups. They put mul lots of different ethnic groups who don't like each other into one country, which is going to be a problem at some point. Um, but those are the historical circumstances. That's the background. We got imperialism. We got scramble for Africa. And I want to focus on three different places. Um, the first one we're going to spend the most time on here, which is South Africa. Um, after World War II, similar to in India, African people helped fight in World War II and World War I, and they were promised it freedom in both times. And after World War II, there is this sense of nationalism around the world, in India, in Africa, in China, um, in Vietnam, and all of these places around the world that have been colonized say, we want our independence. We helped you fight in this war. Give us our independence. World War II is done. You fought against Nazism and horrible treatment. You are treating us horribly. Give us our independence. And there's this push around the world. In South Africa, the government, which is made up of 10% white people, decide to go the opposite way of independence and freedom. And they create a system that is even stricter and more, more restrictive is what I want to say, and even harsher than what existed before. And this system is called the apartheid system. The easy way to remember this is the root of the word here is apart. It is segregation. And the idea here is to segregate white people in South Africa from black people in South Africa and create two different cultures basically, or two different systems. Now, again, white people made up 10% of the population, black people made up 90% of the population. They are going to segregate in terms of education. So schooling, both elementary, middle, high school, college, segregation in terms of marriage. There's no intermarriage allowed between white and black people. In terms of voting, white people can vote, black people cannot. So imagine everyone who is elected is white and they are obviously all pushing this apartheid system. A living space, meaning you can't live in areas that aren't designated for black people or for white people. You have to stay in your segregated area. And something called the pass law, meaning that only black, this is a law that only black people had to follow, where you had to carry around a pass book. And if you left your town, you had to get permission from the local government to leave your town. For example, if you wanted to leave West Hampton Beach and go to Sayville, and you wanted to travel and you were black in South Africa in the apartheid system, you had to get permission from the local government to stamp your passport, basically like a local passport. And if you're white, you don't have to do this. So these laws are very restrictive. And I wanted, I said this when we talked about segregation in early Nazi Germany, the United States at the same time has very similar laws. So I don't, it's, 
we judge this and we should, but also keep in mind that there's other places around the world that are doing this kind of horrible segregation. Um, and it's really, really, this is like an extreme, extreme segregation. Um, and it's in order to make sure this nationalism amongst black people in South Africa don't, doesn't come to the surface. However, there are nationalist movements. There are people who are educated in South Africa, who are helping run the government, who are um, black, who decide, and by the way, please don't call them African-Americans. That's only people in America. People mess up on essays and writing stuff like that. The people in African-Americans in South Africa were push, pushing for independence. It doesn't make any sense. Please don't say it. Um, in this case, there's a group called the African National Congress or the ANC. Not to get confused with the Indian National Congress, but they have the same kind of message. In this case, the African National Congress wants to create equality for all people in South Africa. They said, we're not discriminating against white people. We just want an equal share of power. We want to be able to vote. We want elections. And they start pushing for this in the 1940s and 50s. And they are peaceful, like Gandhi, very much like, let's boycott, let's protest, let's march, let's call out this and that. And they find that it doesn't work. And they do this for like 20 years. And in the 1960s, they're like, screw this, let's start going violent. And by violent, I mean they're going to blow up trains with diamonds that have been mined. They're going to blow up train cars with oil on them. They are going to assassinate high-ranking leaders of this apartheid South African government. And as a result of this and becoming more violent, a lot of their members start getting arrested. And their main leader, the leader of this ANC who becomes the figurehead or the face of this movement is this guy right here. His name is Nelson Mandela. Um, you may have heard of him. He is going to be arrested and sentenced to life in prison um, at a place called Robben Island in 1962, along with 1,500 other members of the ANC. So they're all put on this little island on the southern tip of South Africa. Um, and they are very limited in what they can do. Um, he is going to be in prison until 1989. The apartheid system in South Africa lasts until the early 90s. So it, it is around when your parents were alive. They grew up with this apartheid system. So like when I talk about judgment, like in the United States, the segregation for the most part in terms of legal segregation ends in the 1960s. Another 30 years it takes for South Africa and people around the world in the 80s and 90s are like, how does this still exist? How do you let a group not vote based on their race? It is crazy and insane. Um, but Mandela is going to be the leader of it. He is freed in 1989. It ends after he is freed in the next couple of years. They, because of protests and other countries putting pressure on South Africa, they end the apartheid system in 1992 and they hold their first free election in 94, meaning that free election, meaning everyone can vote. And Mandela is elected the first president um, of this kind of new end of apartheid government. He runs for two terms. He wins in two terms. Um, and one thing they do do, they do do, oh, that sounds weird. One thing they do in South Africa is they do have something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. People were treated horribly under apartheid. Black people were treated horrifically awful. There were crazy crimes committed by the apartheid government, both killing people who were imprisoned, torturing people, awful stuff. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, here's what we're going to do. Instead of seeking retribution or um, paybacks on all of these members of the apartheid government, let's just say if you admit to your crimes and apologize for them, you will be forgiven. So instead of locking up all the apartheid leaders, let's do that. And it actually works for the most part. Um, there's an issue today, even in 2024, of this unequal distribution of wealth. I mean, you got to think this apartheid system was in place for a long enough time and white people had so much power in South Africa that to even it up is very difficult. So there's still this huge unequal distribution of wealth, meaning that some people are really rich, some people are really poor. Um, but apartheid is over. So that's positive. Mandela died um, in the uh, 2010s. So yeah, um, last piece. Okay, so that's South Africa. Just two other places I want to point out and mention real quick. Um, some in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I want to come back here for a second. You can see here, this is the dates of independence. Some of these countries up here in the 1940s, 1950s, 60s. And you can see from 61, from 19, in 1960 to 61, 64, all these countries in Sub-Saharan Africa gained their independence. So the question is, how do they do it? So some of them do it peacefully. They boycott and protest and kind of ask for it. And one example is Ghana, which is located right here on the west coast of Africa. Um, one of my favorite flags, by the way. And in 1957, they gained their independence. This is uh, the leader of that movement, again, a nationalist movement. His name is Kwame Nkrumah. Um, and this is him right here. And he's meeting with the queen at the time of England, Queen Elizabeth, so who just passed away a couple years ago. And so we have Nkrumah, and they peacefully boycott some protests, and it works. Other places are like, they try and peacefully boycott and protest, and it doesn't work, and they have to fight and use um, violence. And one example is a place called Kenya, which is over here. Um, and in Kenya, 
Their leader is Jomo Kenyatta, easy to remember, Kenya Kenyatta. Um, and he's leader of a nationalist group, and they're called the Mau Mau's. Um, and they actually fight a war against uh, the Europeans um, in order to gain their independence. So some people negotiate their independence. Hey, can we get our independence? Okay, sure. Some people have to fight wars. Do we? Can we get our independence? No. All right, we'll fight. And then they get their independence after they win. So that's kind of the gist of it. We have a couple different things going on. Those are our three case studies. That's a quick overview. Sub-Saharan Africa, decolonization, as always, you know the deal. Write it down. Let me know. I'm out.